So y'all had the option today of either looking at uh, Buddhism or Taoism. And y'all chose Taoism, which is one of my favorite philosophies. So I always feel incredibly blessed when I get to present this to students, especially to students who haven't heard of this philosophy of life. The thinker we're looking at today is Alan Watts. You may have heard some of his lectures on YouTube. He was somebody who became pretty popular in the 20th century. And what he tried to do during his life was make Eastern philosophy accessible to Western audiences. Now, I think this is a cool and noble goal because so much of how we see the world is caught up in a particular idea about, well, what can exist and what can exist, how these things are related, and so on. In other words, what we've basically been doing this whole class is Western philosophy. And Western philosophy has certain properties, properties which are not going to be a part of the worldview that we're looking at today. For starters, Western philosophy is based on what we might call Aristotelian logic. So, can this cup be in this place and not in this place at the same time? Yes or no? You're all shaking your heads. You're like, no, that's stupid. What the hell are you talking about? This is based on an Aristotelian logical idea that something either has a property or it doesn't have it. It can't have it and not have it at the same time or something is a certain way, or it's not that way. It can't be that way and not that way at the same time. This is what we might call mutual exclusivity. It's described by that syllogism right there, A or not A. For any property, a thing either has it or it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to say, oh yeah, this cup is both blue and not blue. According to our Western idea and worldview, that doesn't make any sense. But as we'll see, Eastern philosophy doesn't exactly hold on to that view. And in that way, it's a little bit paradoxical. But that'll become a little bit clearer as we talk about one of the underlying concepts of Taoism. So that's the first thing you need to understand about how we see and move and act within the world in the West. The second thing is that the way that we see the world in Western society is rather dualistic. There's good and there's evil. And these things are different. There's right and there's wrong. There's good and there's bad. There's high and low, right and left, tasty and not tasty. And these things are very different, right? You might say, good is in conflict with evil. And neither of these things have anything to do with each other, right? This is something that you might see embodied in the Christian worldview, for example. Just like we saw in the first unit, so many of the philosophers who provided different metaphysical views said, well, look, the universe is made up of things that are either physical or non-physical, right? And Descartes' view especially echoes this kind of dualistic way of thinking. He thought that everything in the universe was made up of two underlying substances at most, right? Mentality and physicality. There are tables and chairs, and then there's the human mind. And these things are different. And so the way that we interpret the world and compartmentalize it and categorize it in the West is very dualistic. And if you just think about your own experiences or your own beliefs, you will see this as well. But as we'll see, Eastern philosophy doesn't exactly hold to this kind of dualism. It doesn't interpret the world in that way. Finally, another thing that we could say about Western philosophy is that it pursues conceptualizing the world. It pursues proper understanding it pursues proper thought and belief, right? What are we trying to do in the West? Well, we're trying to understand how all of this stuff works, right? If we apply our proper concepts and ideas to things, we can 
quote unquote, get it right. The way that we approach the world is fundamentally one of understanding it, thinking that we can use concepts and words and numbers to capture the essence of things. In Eastern philosophy, however, they don't exactly utilize this same disposition. As we'll see Watts explain today, he doesn't think that the categories that we have for things and the things themselves are the same thing. Nor can the categories, the words, the numbers, the concepts stand in as a holistic representation of the underlying reality that they're trying to describe. So these are some fundamental differences between the kind of philosophy that we've been doing up until this point and Eastern philosophy. One small view which we're going to look at today. You could also check out Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism. Those are all examples of Eastern philosophies as well. But today we are going to talk about Taoism. So any questions so far? Is that making sense, kind of? OK, good. So we're looking at Taoism. And in order to do that, I asked you to read one chapter of this book, Alan Watts's book, Tao the Water Course Way. The first thing that you need to know about this view is that it is based in ancient Eastern Chinese philosophy. So in all the ways that we just mentioned, it's different from how the West has conceptualized and thought about the universe. But it's also rooted in ancient Chinese tradition and history. And it would be a good idea for you all to have a kind of grasp on the historical context also in which this view arose. Its seminal text is the Tao Te Ching, which is said to have been a compiled uh, set of the sayings and teachings of this guy named Lao Tzu that was put together by his students. Some of its core principles were formulated during what is called the Warring States period in Chinese history. This was a period in history for China that was deeply chaotic. There was a lot of violence and bloodshed. There wasn't so much a centralized authority keeping things in order like Hob would like. Rather, there were all of these warring states and regions that were vying for power and control over resources, over the land, and over each other. Consequently, you might say, what Taoism is doing is it's trying to provide for us a philosophy of life that might help us move through those times that are very uncertain and insecure. This historical context has given it some meaning and some orientation. And it has been critical in how the Taoists have come to see the world and the kind of philosophy of life that they espouse. So that's another little thing you're going to want to know. Central to a lot of Eastern philosophy, especially Chinese philosophy, is this concept, which I'm sure you've seen represented before. Let me see if I can do it well. I don't know. That's kind of shitty. But what is that? Right. One of these is black and one of them is white, right? In the West, we call it yin and yang. In the East, a lot of them call it yin and yang. Apparently, that is the more correct pronunciation. In any case, it doesn't matter. What you need to know is that this idea underlies Taoism and a lot of other Eastern Chinese philosophies. And what this symbol is supposed to represent is this idea of polarity. How to best explain that? It's kind of a complex idea, but I'll do my best here.
you can kind of think about it as a negation of thinking that the world is just dualistic or that things in the universe are at war or at conflict with each other and that things are separate and distinct and have their own essences. What this concept represents is basically the philosophy that is antithetical to all of that. The Taoists are going to say, for example, that we make use of these oppositional concepts and categories to make sense of the world, like good and bad, high and low, right and left, right and wrong. In the West, we think these oppositions are fundamentally distinct and separate from one another. We think that good is at war with evil. They are in conflict and they're different things. Right action is fundamentally different and distinct and separate from wrong action. Highness is separate and distinct and different from lowness. But what this concept is supposed to represent is that that idea that these poles of things are in conflict or at war or are separate and distinct, that idea is wrong. Rather, they're going to say that Everything that exists in the universe exists in relation to everything else. And so they're going to hold a more monistic view. When we're talking about any one thing, what we're actually invoking is it and its relations to everything else. In other words, it's not as if there is mentality and physicality and these things are separate and distinct, but rather we are all part of this one underlying unified system. That is why I described it as monistic. And so when we say something is right or wrong, according to this philosophy, we're picking out an aspect of it, but that aspect is not distinct or separate from any other aspect of that thing. Rather, in some fundamental way, Right and wrong are related to one another and depend on each other. They depend on each other for their existence. We saw this idea already when I echoed the philosophy of Nietzsche in one of my previous lectures, where he said that joy and sorrow are twins, and that the extent to which you can experience true joy in your life is proportional to how much sorrow you've experienced. That kind of idea is contained in this symbol. So the Taoists are going to say, high cannot exist without low. Right cannot exist without wrong. It's a mistake to try to make one of these triumph over the other. They are not actually at war with one another. From our point of view, it looks like we can divide up the world into these distinct things. But really, all of it exists in this complex web of relations and forms one unifying system. So it doesn't make sense to talk about good without also invoking the concept of evil. Evil would not exist without good, and vice versa. Right would not exist without wrong. Heat would not exist without cold. All of these kind of go together and as we'll see, mutually arise. And so everything in the universe, the Taoists are going to say, is related to everything else, and everything depends for its existence on everything else also. Alan Watts talks about this on pages 19 and 20 in this book, which I will read for you now. This is from the chapter, The Yin-Yang Polarity. At the very roots of Chinese thinking and feeling, there lies the principle of polarity, which is not to be confused with the ideas of opposition or conflict. In the metaphors of other cultures, light is at war with darkness, life is at war with death, good with evil, and the positive with the negative. 
And thus, an idealism to cultivate the former and be rid of the latter flourishes throughout much of the world. To the traditional way of Chinese thinking, though, this is as incomprehensible as an electric current without both positive and negative poles. For polarity is the principle that plus and minus, north and south, are different aspects of one and the same system, and that the disappearance of either one of them would be the disappearance of the system. Continuing on just a few pages later, the key relationship between yang and yin is called hisheng sheng, mutual arising or inseparability. As Lao Tzu puts it, when everyone knows beauty as beautiful, there is already ugliness. When everyone knows good as goodness, there is already evil. To be and not to be mutually arise. They exist in relation to one another. They are dependent on each other. They go together. Difficult and easy are mutually realized. Long and short are mutually contrasted. High and low are mutually posited. Before and after are in mutual sequence. They are thus like the different but inseparable sides of a coin, the poles of a magnet, or pulse and interval in any vibration. There is never the ultimate possibility that either one will win over the other, for they are more like lovers wrestling than enemies fighting. And so he says in the footnote, it is thus of interest that a common Chinese expression for sexual intercourse is Hua Chen, the flowery combat, in which, of course, there is no wish in either partner to annihilate the other. But Watts continues, it is difficult in our logic, our Western logic, to see that being and non-being are mutually generative and mutually supportive. For it is the great and imaginary terror of Western man that nothingness will be the permanent end of the universe. We do not easily grasp the point that the void is creative, and that being comes from non-being as sound from silence and light from space. So let's just use an example here. OK, everybody, just listen. Ah! Okay, where did that sound come from? Right? You're going to say, it came from you, Professor Gunner. Watts might say, it came from silence. What exists comes out of nothingness or the void in some sense. When you write a poem, when you produce a song, something new, where does that come from? It comes from nothing. Right? And somehow it springs into existence. And so, quoting again, Lao Tzu, 30 spokes unite at the wheel's hub. It is the center hole, literally from their not being, that makes it useful. Shape clay into a vessel. It is the space within that makes it useful. Cut out doors and windows for a room. It is the holes which make it useful. Therefore, profit comes from what is there, usefulness from what is not there. This might sound like spiritual woo-woo to you, but that is because we're not accustomed to thinking in this way due to how we have conceptualized and interpret the world. Thus, to summarize, in contrast to this dualistic way that we look at things, this disposition or tendency that we have to understand and control the universe, this concept that everything either is a thing or it's not the thing, this Aristotelian logic, Eastern philosophy is basically going to hold what you might call the opposite of that. It's going to be a monistic view. We're all part of this one underlying same system. We are all a participant in it. Our existence is in relation to everything else, and what makes us who we are is constituted by those relations. 
So we do not exist in isolation. We are not inseparable from all of this stuff. Just as high is not inseparable from low, good is not inseparable from evil. Thus, Taoism is informed by the idea that the universe is one, you might say. This is what we would call a monistic philosophy. The boundaries and distinctions that we have between things are kind of mental fabrications. They don't ultimately ontologically hold. Everything is a part of the same underlying system. Everything exists in relation, is inseparable to everything else. Which means that everything is connected in some fundamental way. And you can't make sense out of any one thing without kind of invoking everything else. OK, does that make sense? Are you following along so far? I know this is very weird. This is very strange. But maybe as we go through this, you'll see the kind of wisdom in what the Taoists think this implies about how you should interpret reality and live your life. I don't know. We'll see. So let's actually talk now about what Watts has to say in this chapter. I just asked you to read chapter 3. The rest of the book is amazing as well. But obviously, I know you're students. You don't have all the time in the world. Again, the philosophy we're looking at today is Taoism. You can kind of separate this into two parts, right? There's Tao, and then there's ism, right? What Taoism is, it's the philosophy of the Tao. So what the heck is this thing? What is the Tao? Well, <laughs> One way that you could understand it is it is what everything is doing. That's what the Tao is. It's described as the course, the flow, the drift, or the process of nature. And everything is a part of nature. So it's how things are going, what things are doing, all of it together. That is what is meant by the Tao. And so what that means is everything is a part of the Tao. That water bottle is a part of the Tao. Your memories are a part of the Tao. The laptop is a part of the Tao. Everything fundamentally is a part of the Tao. So another way to think about it is the Tao is the set of all things and what they are doing. That's what it is. There is a lot of water imagery that's used in this philosophy. Because they conceive of the world as something that is in flux, something that is going on. Things are happening, right? The grass is growing out in the fields. You're having emotions. Thoughts spring up in your mind. Animals are growing and reproducing. Water is flowing. There's stuff happening. And all that stuff that is happening, that is what is meant by that three-letter word. This is a very different conception than how we might think of God, for example, in Western society. How do we conceptualize God? Well, we think about God as this thing that is all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing, personable entity, right? If you're Christian uh, and you read the Bible, it says that God goes through experiences and has emotions, right? God has some sort of uh, spiritual or conscious existence in that way, right? And the God that approaches us in Christianity is one that loves us, that is a distinct person, three persons, in his own right, who exists outside of space-time, right? But who created everything. God was there, doing his thing, and then he decided to create our universe. And at some point, if you believe Christianity, he 
incarnated into our universe through the person of Jesus Christ, but he's fundamentally separate from it, right? He's a creator. He's not a part of the universe like grass is a part of the universe or atoms are a part of the universe. The Taoists don't think about things like that, okay? You could call the Tao God in Eastern philosophy. But if you did, that concept of God would be very different from the concept of God that we have. The Eastern concept of God, or at least the Taoist one, doesn't posit that God is separate from nature, doesn't posit that God only has these positive properties, right? Righteousness, goodness, honesty, whatever, so on and so forth. <laughs> and what's also contained in the Western idea of God is that God is something that can be known and grasped, right? You've heard this in people's personal testimonies and if you've ever gone to church, right? Have you found God? Do you know God? Oh, God spoke to me, right? I have a personal relationship with God. This isn't how the Taoists are going to conceive of the Tao. In Western philosophy, because there is this drive or tendency to pursue proper thought and understanding and conceptualization, we think that we could achieve, hypothetically, a complete knowledge of the universe <coughs> if we just put the right concepts and words to things, the right ideas. But the Taoists are going to say, anytime you use a category or a concept or a mental representation or idea, it's always going to fall short of the mark. Because those labels and categories that you're attaching to things are not the same thing as the thing that you're trying to talk about. So the word grass isn't the same thing as what's out there in the field, right? Your concept of, uh, I don't know, righteousness is not the same thing as what righteousness is in reality, right? It's a label, it's a category. And so when it comes to this idea of the Tao, and this is what makes Taoism so difficult to actually talk about, is that the Tao cannot actually be defined or conceptualized at all. So we're engaging in a little paradox here. Because I'm trying to give you the right ideas by which to understand this philosophy, but at the same time, this is not a philosophy that you can intentionally follow or understand at all. It's very strange. But that is the way of things. The Tao is not a concept or an idea. The Tao is what is. It's ultimate reality. And so any attempt that we might leverage to describe it accurately, to understand it, or to know it, is always going to fall short of the mark. The Tao simply is everything and what it's doing. And so any category or concept we try to attach to it is not going to capture it. Does that make sense? Reality exceeds our concepts and ideas. And thus the Tao is always going to escape our understanding. It is not something we can control. It's something that we are a part of, but it's not something that can be known and grasped like a mathematical theorem can be. And Watts talks about this on page 42. He says, Tao cannot be defined in words and is not an idea or concept. As Chung Tzu says, it may be attained but not seen. Or, in other words, felt, but not conceived. Intuited, but not categorized. Divined, but not explained. In a similar way, air and water cannot be cut or clutched. 
and their flow ceases when they are enclosed. There is no way of putting a stream in a bucket or the wind in a bag. Verbal description and definition may be compared to the latitudinal and longitudinal nets which we visualize upon the earth and the heavens to define and enclose the positions of mountains and lakes, planets and stars. But earth and heaven are not cut by these imaginary lines. As Wittgenstein said, laws, like the law of causation, treat of the network and not what the network describes. The game of Western philosophy and science is to trap the world, trap the universe in the networks of words and numbers, so that there is always the temptation to confuse the rules or laws of grammar and mathematics with the actual operations of nature. We must not, however, overlook the fact that human calculation, human under understanding, human reasoning, is also an operation of nature. But just as trees do not symbolize or represent rocks, our thoughts, even if intended to do so, do not necessarily represent trees and rocks. Thoughts grow in brains as grass grows in fields. Any correspondence between them is abstract, as between ten roses and ten stones, which does not take into account the smell and color of the roses or the shapes and structures of the stones. Although thought is in nature and a part of nature, we must not confuse the game rules of thought with the patterns of nature itself. So that's what makes this lecture so paradoxical and strange. What I'm giving you today is a philosophy of life that you cannot intentionally follow or understand. <laughs> it's something that you just have to do naturally. But we'll get there later. So the ideas and the concepts that we have are not the same thing as what is actually going on in reality. That's one concept. The other idea is this mutual arising that we talked about before. According to Taoism, everything or event is what it is only in relation to everything else. So in our, in our Western society, we will say things like, that chair is different and separate than the table, right? I'm different or separate from you. We're not the same thing. I have my own essence. You have your own essence. But this is not how Taoism interprets the world. Rather, what makes that chair what it is, is, well, how it exists in relation to everything else. And so everything is a part of the same underlying interconnected interdependent system. The meaning that a thing has for us or the meaning of an event is a function of how that thing or event is related to everything else that's going on. This is what is meant by this Sheng Shun idea. Everything is mutually arising. Things are not ultimately fundamentally distinct and separate from one another. They exist together. They're coming up together. They're all participating in this system together. This is related to that image that we saw earlier of yin and yang, right? Good and evil, they will say, arise together. One is not going to win out over the other because they both depend on each other for their existence, and they go together. So everything in the universe is interconnected and interdependent with everything else. If we were going to try to describe how the universe works, according to Taoism, we may say the following. We're all part of this flow or process of nature. 
in our minds we try to cut up and divvy up the world into separate things. But really, all is a part of the same thing, man. All is a part of the Tao. You're a part of the Tao. I'm a part of the Tao. The grass out there, the concrete wall, it's all the Tao, man. That's basically what's going on. Okay? Now, it's a little paradoxical, though, because... And this is the problem with describing this view. Although everything is a part of the Tao, the Tao manifests itself in many different ways. In, in some way, right? This cup is not the same thing as this book, right? We can say, yes, they're part of the Tao, but look. Like this thing is floppy and this thing is rigid, this thing holds liquid and this one does not hold liquid well, right? This is a very commonsensical view. Well, Taoism also admits of that. Yes, everything is a part of the Tao, but the Tao manifests in different ways. Thus, as some shorthand we can say that things have their own natures. That is, the way that uh, the particular manifestation that they are may follow different rules and principles than other manifestations. Does that make sense? So I can cut this book, but I can't cut this with the scissors, right? This is the idea that they're trying to invoke when they're talking about how things operate and how things behave in the universe and how things should behave. According to Taoism, everything operates only according to its nature. Things cannot be or act other than what they are. So, the way this book behaves is, well, according to its book nature, whatever that is. It's booking right now. This cup is not booking. This cup is cupping. Trees out there are treeing. Weasels are weaseling. Humans are humaning. Okay? So, although we're all part of the same underlying thing, how we appear and the rules and principles that we follow are going to look differently from other things. The general idea here is that Taoism is going to say the problem with the way that we interpret and move and act within the world is that we try to control and grasp everything. That we try to make things do what they are not designed to do. Try using this as a hammer, for example. How is that going to work out for you? Try using a laptop as a plate. Maybe that'll work out a little great, but probably not, right? Try using your folder as a bowl to hold your ramen, right? That's not going to work. And so what they're going to prescribe is basically allow things to go their own way. You shouldn't try to force anything to be what it is not. That includes the environment, that includes yourself, that includes other people. There is this general faith or trust in Taoism in the idea that if everything was just allowed to do what it's doing, the harmony of the universe would be established. This is why Watt says, if everything is allowed to go its own way, the harmony of the universe will be established since every process in the world can do its own thing only in relation to all others. A good example of this might be an ecosystem. Imagine all of the parts of an ecosystem, right? All of the bugs, the plants, the animals, they exist as a part of this system in which each thing is playing its part or playing its role. 
right? The bugs depend on the grass and the, the plants to do their own thing and grow so that they can feed on them. The birds depend on the bugs doing their own thing so they can feed on them and survive and reproduce. Imagine if we changed any part of an ecosystem such that it was not doing its thing anymore. What would happen? Imagine we went into an ecosystem and we injected all the plants with a drug that prevented them from growing and flowering. What would happen? Good things? No, the whole thing would get fucked up, right? The whole ecosystem would collapse. There's a similar idea here. Things are going to operate according to their natures and they should be allowed to do so because trying to force or intervene in things causes problems. It causes trouble for ourselves and others. And he talks about this on page 43. Perhaps 42 to 43. Allow me to read. Now the Chinese and Taoist term, which we translate as nature, is zujan, meaning the spontaneous, that which is so of itself. We might call it the automatic or automotive, were it not that these words are associated with mechanisms and artifacts, which are not truly so of themselves. Nature, as zujan, might be taken to mean that everything grows up and operates independently on its own and to be the meaning of the verse. As I sit quietly doing nothing, spring comes and grass grows of itself. But it is basic to the Taoist view of the world that every thing or event, she or wu, is what it is only in relation to all others. The earth and every tiniest thing upon it inevitably goes with the sun, moon, and stars. It needs them just as much as it needs and consists of its own elements. Conversely, the sun would not be light without eyes, nor would the universe exist without consciousness, and vice versa. This is the principle of mutual arising, or Shang Shung, which is explained in the second chapter of the Tao Te Ching. The principle is that if everything is allowed to go its own way, the harmony of the universe will be established since every process in the world can do its own thing only in relation to all others. The political analogy is Kropotkin's anarchism, the theory that if people are left alone to do as they please, to follow their nature and discover what truly pleases them, a social order will emerge of itself. Individuality is inseparable from community. In other words, the order of nature is not a forced order. It is not the result of laws and commandments which beings are compelled to obey by external violence. For in the Taoist view, there really is no obdurately external world. My inside arises mutually with my outside. And though the two may differ, they cannot be separated. Thus, everything's own way is the own way of the universe, of the Tao. Because of the mutual interdependence of all beings, they will harmonize if left alone and not forced into conformity with some arbitrary, artificial, and abstract notion of order. And this harmony will emerge, Zujan, of itself, without external compulsion. No organization, in the political and commercial sense of the word, is organic. Organizations, in this sense, are based on the following of linear rules and laws opposed from above, imposed from above. That is, of strung out, serial, one thing at a time, sequences of words and signs, which can never grasp the complexity of nature, although nature is only complex in relation to the impossible task of translating it into these linear signs. Outside the human world, the order of nature goes along without consulting books. But our human fear is that the Tao, which cannot be described, the order which cannot be put into books, is chaos.
So, the general idea is we should allow things to do naturally what they're going to do, including ourselves, including other people. It is when you try to impose rules and laws on other people and you try to control them that things get all mucked up. If I told you all right now, no, you can't have Chipotle tonight. No. What's the first thing you want to do? You're like, fuck Professor Gunner. I'm getting Chipotle tonight. Right? <laughs> Our human worry, Watts is saying, is that if we just allow things to do what they're going to do, there's going to be chaos and violence and it's all going to be terrible. But the Taoists are going to say, no, probably not. Like, look at what's going on out there in those ecosystems. Each thing is doing its own thing, and they're all surviving. Flourishing, you might say, right? Reproducing. In one of his lectures, Watts calls nature a mutual eating society. From our human point of view, we think it's terrible and awful that you know, the lion eats the gazelle and that's bad. But that's how things work. And the gazelles keep reproducing. And the gazelles provide food for the lions so they can go on reproducing. And the ecosystem is in equilibrium. It is only when we try to control and force things that the equilibrium disappears. And the same is going to hold true of people according to the Taoists, how we should run society. So much of what we're trying to do in the Western world is control and grasp and force and intervene to make the world in our image because we know what's right, we know what's good, we have the knowledge and the power to make things as we see it. And we know what's going on, and we can do it, and we should do it. The Taoists have the completely opposite view. They're going to say, take your hands off, okay? Trying to control and force people into doing things is only going to cause disharmony. And so the idea is, in society and our relationships with other people, we should trust ourselves and others in human nature. This seems like a scary thing to do, but if you think about it, if people were just allowed to do what they want to do, do you think there's going to be mass chaos in the world? Or are people largely going to leave each other alone? I don't know about you, but I don't give a crap what's going on over there. Just leave me alone. I just want to do my thing. I feel like a lot of people feel like that, right? Let me do my painting. Let me listen to my music. Don't try to force me into some social role or expectation. That's when I get mad. That's when I lash out. Just let me go my own way. This kind of principle was used to great effect in ancient China, which is why Lao Tzu says that the best ruler or emperor is the one that is not seen, who takes only the minimal action necessary to support the harmony of the system that they are ruling over. And so this philosophy is very different, for example, from Keller's and from how we do things in the West. What have your parents been encouraging you to do since you were a little kid? You gotta work hard in school. You gotta study hard. You gotta do all these things. You're not gonna wanna do them, but you gotta do them if you wanna be happy and successful, right? You have to be a productive member of society. You have to follow these rules. You have to master yourself. You need to transform the kind of thing you are 
So you will do the things that society and our economy and all these people expect of you. Otherwise, you're screwed, right? You don't want to study, but you got to spend three hours studying. You don't want to take the GRE, but you got to take the GRE. You don't want to get a job, but you got to get a job, you lazy piece of shit. The Taoists are going to say, this forcing and controlling doesn't work. It usually ends up making things worse. It produces resentment. It produces revolution. It produces anger and sadness and despair. Let's take up the ecosystem example again. Think of how many ecosystems we've messed up on this earth because we've gone in there and we've bulldozed a bunch of trees or we've cut down forests or we've introduced invasive species into places that they don't belong because we need to make money, because we need power, because we need to control things. Yeah, the Taoists are going to say, look at how we've messed up so much stuff by, by forcing ourselves into that, those situations, by meddling, by grasping, by trying to control everything. So the Taoist is not going to say, work hard to transform yourself and do the things you don't want to do to be successful. The Taoist is not going to say, be a completely different person. Follow the rules. Stay in line. Control yourself. Instead, what they're trying to get us to see is that if we foster a kind of acceptance of the way things are, if we foster a kind of love and compassion for how things operate and what they naturally are like, we can use that knowledge and that love to great effect, to live our lives in a way that is meaningful without having to control and grasp everything. It is for this reason that the Taoists encourage what is called Wu Wei. It can be translated as non-action, but it doesn't mean just sitting around eating Cheetos all day in your parents' basement playing World of Warcraft, okay? It means something a little bit different. Watts talks about this later in the book. In chapter 4, he has a whole chapter on Wu Wei. Quoting the Tao Te Ching, the Tao does nothing, and yet nothing is left undone. These famous words of Lao Tzu obviously cannot be taken in their literal sense, for the principle of non-action, or Wu Wei, is not to be considered inertia, laziness, laissez-faire, or mere passivity. Among the several meanings of Wei are to be, to do, to make, to practice, to act out. And in the symbol that is used for the term, it means false, simulated, counterfeit. But in the context of Taoist writings, it quite clearly means forcing, meddling, and artifice. In other words, trying to act against the grain of Li, or the operations of the thing the principle that underlies the thing. Thus, Wu Wei might be better translated as not forcing. This is what we mean by going with the grain, rolling with the punch, swimming with the current, trimming sails to the wind, taking the tide at its flood, and stooping to conquer. It is perhaps best exemplified in the Japanese arts of Judo and Aikido where an opponent is defeated by the force of his own attack, and the latter art reaches such heights of skill that I have seen an attacker thrown to the floor without even being touched. The principle is illustrated by the parable of the pine tree and the willow tree in heavy snow. The pine branch, being rigid, 
cracks under the weight of the snow. But the willow branch yields to the weight, right? It is flexible, and the snow falls off. Note, however, that the willow is not limp, but springy. Wu Wei is thus the lifestyle of one who follows the Tao. It must be understood primarily as a form of intelligence. That is, of knowing the principles, structures, and trends of human and natural affairs so well that one uses the least amount of energy in dealing with them. But this intelligence is, as we have seen, not simply intellectual. It is also the unconscious intelligence of the whole organism, in particular the innate wisdom of the nervous system. Wu Wei is a combination of this wisdom with taking the line of least resistance in all of one's actions. It is not the mere avoidance of effort. In Judo, for example, one uses muscle, but only at the right moment, when the opponent is off balance or has overexerted himself. But even this effort has a peculiarly unforced quality, which is called chi, roughly equivalent to the Sanskrit prana, an energy associated with the breath. This may be illustrated with the Aikido exercise of the unbendable arm. The right arm is extended to the front and the opponent is invited to bend it. If the arm is held rigidly, a strong opponent will certainly bend it. If, on the other hand, it is held out easily, with the eyes fixed on a distant point, and with the feeling that it is a rubber hose through which water is flowing towards the point, it will be extremely difficult to bend. Without straining, one simply assumes that the arm will stay straight, come what may, because of the flow of chi through the arm. During the test, breathe out slowly as if from the belly, and think of the breath as moving through the arm this is perhaps a form of what we call, or rather miscall, self-hypnosis. I have found that something of the same kind can be used to open a stiff cap on a jar. And I used to know an old Zen master, frail in appearance, who seemingly by leaning against them, moved heavy rocks which defeated stronger, younger men. Just as water flow follows gravity, and if trapped, rises to find a new outlet, so Wu Wei is the principle that gravity is energy. And the Taoist finds in gravity a constant stream which may be used in the same way as the wind or a current. Falling with gravity constitutes the immense energy of the earth spinning in its orbit around the sun. So the Taoists are going to say, you can find peace and fulfillment if you go with the flow of things, not trying to force things, not trying to control things, not trying to make things the way you want them to be, but flowing with it. This is not a way that we're used to thinking and acting in the West. We are anxious, right? We want to control. We want to impose upon the world our image of it. Oh, I need to make things better. Oh, I need to do this and that or else oh, what's going to happen to me? Oh my God. We are insecure. We are worried. We are anxious because we're worried thing things aren't going to go the way that we want. But if you could learn to cultivate a kind of acceptance for what happens and learn how things work, right? If you could learn how things work, you can be able to live a life that achieves your aims without straining too hard, without having to control things, without having to worry. You can't control this vast process of nature you can't control whether somebody likes you or not. You can't control if somebody thinks you're, thinks you're smart or stupid. But you worry about that stuff, right? You want to make others like you. You want to make yourself into a better person. You want to force situations to go the way that you want. 
but the Taoist is going to say this is the wrong way to approach life. Look at what I'm wearing today. As much as I love y'all, I don't give a shit about what you think of me. I dressed for comfort because I wanted to be comfortable today. That's what I wanted. So I went with the flow. I'm wearing my old college t-shirt that's, God, I don't even know how many years old it is. It's got holes in it. Spent a lovely time drinking my coffee this morning. Not even really preparing for this. I didn't do any reading. I didn't do any preparation. What the Taoists are going to say is you need to cultivate some kind of faith and trust that if you just allow things to do what they're going to do, it's going to be fine. So much worry and stress and negative feeling comes from, well, trying to control everything. Trying to make things a certain way. But you have limited control, really. Really over what happens. And so instead of worrying about that, why don't you just try to understand better how things are going to go so you know when to act and what to do with the least energy possible to ride the wave. They think that this is going to be a much more peaceful and fulfilling life if you can manage to do this. And if we allow people to just follow their own natures, well, they're highly predictable then, right? Because <laughs> you know how people are like in your life, the relationships that you formed. If you know somebody well, you go out to eat with them, you know what they're going to choose. You know if they're going to do something or not. And you can use that wisdom and intelligence to your advantage so that you don't have to expend so much effort and energy. So the Taoists are going to say, like, look, it's not about being lazy. It's not about just sitting at home. It's about using your knowledge and intuition to only act when you have to. That is the intelligent way to live. It will save you a lot of time. It will save you a lot of money and a lot of energy. But this is not how we think about things. This is not a philosophy that we're used to. We're not used to interpreting reality in this way. If one is going to be a Taoist, they're going to have to shift how they interpret reality, how they deal with stuff, their disposition to it, their psychological state. We are taught and conditioned from a young age that we have to control and pursue doggedly and grasp. But the Taoists are going to say not only is that you know, actually impossible, but it's unwise. Trying to control other people, trying to force yourself to do something, it ain't going to work, right? How many times have you tried to force yourself into a better sleep schedule? or a better exercise routine. How's that worked out for you? I can tell you how it's worked out for me. It's done shit for me. <laughs> it doesn't work. And so this way of looking at things and moving in the world is so fundamentally different from how we are educated to think about and do things. So much of our pain and suffering comes from expectation, comes from lack of control, comes from lack of certainty. But you don't have to think and live like that, right? You don't have to take everything so damn seriously all the time. When I was in college, I thought I had to get all A's 
in all of my classes and I put incredible pressure on myself. It didn't serve me. It wasn't good for me. Getting a B in this class is not going to be the end of the world. It's probably not even going to matter, <laughs> right? Who's going to care if you got a B in a philosophy class? Nobody. So, if this is something that appeals to you, if you think this is interesting, Taoism is going to encourage just go with the flow of things. Don't try to force things. Don't take everything so seriously. Things are going to come and go. Flux is a natural part of life. You have limited control over what actually goes on out there. But you do have a lot of control over your own attitude towards life and how you interpret things and how you react to things. Thus, in Buddhism and Taoism as well, they're going to encourage us to let go. Let go of your worries. Let go of your need to control. Let go of your need for security and guarantees. Let go of trying to make other people like you. Let go of trying to control this vast process that you do not understand and couldn't control in principle. This is what makes Taoism so paradoxical. I've been throwing all these words at you. I've been rambling. I've been trying to explain this the best way that I can. But this is not something that can be explained to you. And this is not something that you can do intentionally or consciously. Why? If you try to intentionally be a Taoist, you're not being a Taoist. Because you're trying to force yourself to be a Taoist. It's something that you kind of just have to see or experience or fall into. Which is why so many Eastern masters teach their students not through rigid conceptual instruction like we do in the West, but through what's called direct pointing. They will just point at something and they will wait until their student can see it. There's a story one time I think of some famous uh, Eastern master who was supposed to give a talk in front of all these people. And this guy was a big deal, and so everybody came. The talk was scheduled, I don't know, for 45 minutes, an hour. The guy got there, and he didn't say a word. He just held up a flower the whole time. Because no amount of me trying to explain this to you is going to get you to live it. Right? No amount of me trying to describe this to you in our Western terms and our Western logic is going to get you to experience the joy and peace that comes with this kind of way of living. And so it's a strange philosophy of life. But it is one that has served many people in Asia for thousands of years. It saw them through a lot of chaos and violence and they still found peace and security and happiness through all of that despite the uncertainty despite the lack of control that they had over their situation so this is something that appeals to you don't try to understand it just try to experience it but don't try if that makes sense. I'd like to end now by just playing a video. You can listen to Alan Watts himself. Oh, is that not going to work? Oh, no. Oh, too bad. Okay, I don't have a video. I guess we can just talk about this then. Not going to waste time trying to look for one. 
So what do you think of this view? Or I should say this way of living, this way of experiencing. kinds of thoughts and feelings are growing up for you. I'm not a big fan of it only because I think as humans we try our best to conceptualize things and I think that brings comfort to people, especially in the West. Yeah. And so I think this... <laughs> it makes you question, yeah, th how you approach life a little bit. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's it can be scary to be shaken out of some of those ideas, right? If you have gone through this class and you have not had, like, some kind of crisis, you haven't been paying attention. This class should scare the hell out of you. But if that didn't happen to you, that doesn't make you a bad person or stupid or anything. Maybe philosophy just isn't for you. My partner is not very philosophical. She doesn't want to talk to me about this stuff. But that's okay, because I have you guys. I just get to talk at you, and you have to listen. It's pretty cool. Okay, what do the rest of y'all think? so good. Never thought I'd get a point in my life where I like black coffee, but Yeah. I think like it's really really like it's a relieving reminder sometimes of like how to live your life because growing up in our society in the West, like it is just a lot of pressure and stress on you a lot. Yeah. From a yeah. really young age. So I think it's like a good reminder that you know, sometimes you do just have to like let go of things because no matter how hard you try to change it, like you don't have control in the end of the day. So it's that's yeah. like the hardest lesson I feel like for people to learn, especially in the West, is just the fact that you don't have any control at all really. And so you think they're it's comforting to yeah. to realize that or to recognize that? Do you think that this way of seeing and acting is something that you try to embody? Or no? I feel like I definitely try to, but it's about it's a lot of like undoing and unlearning, like Right. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. like the hard part. Is Deconditioning yeah. yourself, right? Yeah, because yeah. I've definitely been in situations where, like, my entire life just kind of, like, flipped over, and I had no control of the situation at all, and there was nothing I could do to change it. Right. And, like, it was just really hard for me to, like, process that at a really young age, too. But, like, I just remember this concept being, like, something that a lot of, like, therapists would talk to me about. Like, just, like, the fact that I don't have control and, like, I don't, I can't change the course of, like, what happened. I can only change, like, how I react and, you know, the whole thing. Right, right. But, yeah, so, I think it's definitely something I try, but, like, like you said, it's just one of those things that's not really, like, fully obtainable unless... You're like not actively trying to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where it becomes difficult, right? Because you might say in the West that we are conditioned into thinking and acting in ways that are contrary to our nature, right? Just think about your daily life. Anybody have to get up this morning and get coffee so that they could wake up and be ready for class? Right? That's trying to control your body to make it do something for you. Whereas what the Taoist would say is you should live like a cat. What do cats do? When they need, when they need to poop, they go to the litter box. They don't hold it. 
When they're tired, they take a nap. When they're bored of looking out the window, they go and play with their toys or they bug their owner. Right? But instead, it's almost as if how we have structured our society is learning to make ourselves do all these things that we don't want to do, right? And, you know, there is some use to that, right? Things need to get done, right? It's nice that the lights stay on, that the plumbing is clear, you know. But the Taoists aren't saying don't do things. They're just saying just don't force yourself to do them. Because you heap stress upon yourself by trying to conform with some image that you have of yourself. You feel stress and anxiety when you're not living up to these expectations that society has placed on you, right? Oh my God, my parents are going to be disappointed in me if I go to art school instead of being an engineer. The Taoists might say, what do you want to do? What is your nature calling you to do? You want to live your life like somebody else's puppet, or do you just want to, you know, go with the flow of things and live a more authentic existence, I suppose? Okay, what do the rest of y'all think? Is this a philosophy that you could follow in our society? What do you think? Yeah. It just like sounds to me very legit. Like it's it just sounds like unrealistic goals to have, you know, just to let go. And it yeah. also doesn't seem like it would give someone like a life of purpose, I guess. But I feel like that's like pretty debatable. Yeah, yeah. I I mean some of the Taoists might say, Why do you need this thing that you're driving at anyway? Why do you need, you know, a goal or a project or you know, something? They might think that is a very Western way of looking at things and be like, you know, just like eat your food and enjoy it and, you know, sleep when you want to sleep. It's going to be fine, man. But maybe you're like, that's unrealistic. Like I need to work, right, to make money. I need to go to school so I can get a job. You know, if I just did always what I wanted to do, maybe I would die, you know, like because I ate too much or whatever else, you know. So, yeah, maybe you think in our... In our system, we wouldn't really be able to follow this because it's set up in a different kind of way. I think there's something to that, yeah. I mean, you could go and just try to live in the forest, right? If you don't want to work, you're like, nah, I don't want to work my retail job anymore. I don't want to work any job. I'm going to go you know, eat some roots and hang out with the rabbits. But that might not be as comfortable as a life, right? <laughs> of course, that would only make you upset if you are attached to these comforts, right? So many of the problems that we experience are what you might call conflicts of re resolution. When is something a problem for you? Because it's not conforming to a certain idea you have about how things should go. Right? If you could shift or let go of your desires and preferences for a lot of things, how much more peace would you have? This is something that the Buddhists are big on. They're going to say the root of all suffering is desire or attachment for things. And so if you can let go of your attachment to things, of how people see you, of whether your parents are proud of you, of whether you're successful by society standards, they're like, you won't suffer. But perhaps that is an unrealistic way to, to think in our very fast-paced society. I don't know. 
But maybe, just maybe, you might be able to apply this a little bit and achieve a kind of peace and security. I'm not sure. Try it out. Talk to people about it. See what they say. Again, my goal is not to get you to think or live in a certain way, but to get you to reflect on all of this. Which is kind of paradoxical given the lecture today because they would say, don't force yourself to reflect on anything. <laughs> OK. Any final comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll end it there. OK. Thank you for coming and listening to me babble on. <laughs>